Good day. So good to be here with you uh, once again. Uh, thank you for inviting me into your, your places, your homes, your, your devices, wherever you are. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And praying that you are well today as, as we deal with many things in our world today. And um, just wanted to say thank you so much for your support and for your prayers and your kindness. And then uh, as we begin to consider the message today, I pray that you will also uh, find a great blessing uh, as you listen to this. Barnett Research Group released their findings April 2011 in Faith in Christianity. And their research focused on the data concerning whether Americans on the whole embrace inclusive or exclusive views of faith. The report examined how Americans operate within a pluralistic religious context. And when it came to universalism, the belief that all human beings will be saved after death, the Americans trended toward inclusive views, uh, exclusive views, pardon me, vice inclusive. 43% agreed and 54% disagreed with the following statement. It doesn't matter what religious faith you follow. And in regard to public opinion, the report uh, found similar trends. 40% agreed and 55% disagreed. And the report also suggested that despite all this, millions of Americans believe that God saves everyone. In response to the statement, if a person is generally good or does enough good things for others, they will earn a place in heaven. 48% agreed and 44% disagreed. And in regard to pluralism, uh, interacting with universalism, 59% of adults believe that Christians and Muslims worship the same God. The, they also asked the question, what about those who identify as born-again Christians? And the research found that born-again Christians were more likely willing to share their faith with others, including a desire to pursue a, a healthy and good relationship with other faith groups. Yet despite this, it seems that many born-again Christians embrace certain features of universalist thought. 25% reported that all people will eventually be saved and accepted by God. 26% reported that it doesn't matter where religious faith you follow, they all teach the same things. In respect to pluralism, 40% of born-again Christians report that they believed Christians and Muslims worship the same God. C.S. Lewis once said, quote, Jesus Christ did not say, go into the world and tell the world that it is quite right. The gospel is completely different. In fact, it is di directly opposed to the world. So please turn now in your Bibles or whatever device you're using, application. Uh, we'll turn to 1 Timothy and we will begin in verse 12 of the first chapter and conclude in verse 17. 1 Timothy verse, chapter 1, verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Almighty Father, 
we thank you for your, your word, your Bible. And as we begin to look at these verses, would you help us, Holy Spirit, to understand them, illuminate our minds and impact our hearts and then move them into our hands and feet as we carry on beyond this moment, this day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this might sound familiar because last week we were actually dealing, or I read these verses, but we, we, we focused last week on verse 12. Today we're going to look at the whole context of it. And we find that in chapter 1 of Paul's letter to Timothy, we found out that certain people had taught, as Paul said, false doctrines. And they were devoting themselves to myths and endless genealogies. And you can see that in the first uh, few verses. In other words, as Paul would say to the Galatian church, they were promoting and teaching another gospel. And what was the result of this in, in the Ephesian church, even in the Galatian church? Well, there was disorder, division, and all sorts of, as Paul would say, speculations and controversies in the church at Ephesus. And this is something we need to keep in mind as we move through Paul's letter in this series. For Paul had instructed Timothy as an apostle of Christ Jesus to deal with the false teachers and turn the church to the true gospel of Jesus Christ, turn the church back to the Bible. And this uh, brings up, a, I think, a really good question. Who is the greatest enemy of Christ's church? Who is the greatest enemy of Christ's church? Now, you might say Satan. And in a way, you would be right in one sense. Uh, Pastor Benjamin Verbeck, I'm not saying that name right, but we'll, I'll use the word, I'll, use, I'll pronounce it Verbeck. In his article addressing our question, uh, highlights Adam and Eve's rebellion against God. And he suggests that, yes, Satan is our enemy and that our battle is against spiritual forces, which the Bible does teach us that. Yet when Adam led the rebellion against God and uh, had this attitude, though, well, the devil made me do it, well, it didn't pan out too well for him. Yes, there is a powerful enemy, but the issue with Adam and Eve's faith, according to Verbeck, is the inner spiritual life. And that's what really counts, and that's what led them to sin. So who is the greatest enemy of Christ's church? A couple, salute, couple of uh, question, uh, places that Verbeck points to is that Hollywood is a secular politician's. May I suggest these ones? Is it the public school system? Is it the false teachers of the 21st century? Another question, why did the Israelites, the people of God, abandon the Lord and serve other gods? Verbeck suggested in a nutshell, it was the erosion of the inner lives. The, the purity and the, faith, and the faithfulness of their faith had eroded and was replaced with a rotting uh, internal idolatry. So who is the greatest enemy of the church? The one that has the potential to destroy if it were not for God's mercy and grace. Verbeck suggests that we take a long look and a good look in the mirror. So here's the point, folks. Yeah, Satan has his, had his agents, agents in the Ephesian church, and they were selling all sorts of spiritual trinkets, weren't they? Yet at the end of the day, each person was responsible before God for which, what, for which they purchased. They were responsible for their own hearts and minds, in other words. The purity of their faith. They needed to be reminded of this truth. And Timothy was the one to bring them back to the reality and the truth of the mercy and grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As we look at our text, we see God's grace and mercy poured into the life of Paul. So who was Paul before Christ? Well, we see it here in verse 13. He, he called himself a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. The first time we encounter Paul is in uh, Acts chapter 7. And there Luke uses, uses Paul's uh, Jewish name and calls him Saul. And, going, and we can even go back to, to the day of Pentecost where we, we should start. And the church of Jerusalem saw tremendous growth by the power of the Holy Spirit. After Peter's first sermon to the Jewish crowds on the day of Pentecost, 
we learned that about 3,000 were added to the church at Jerusalem. And the, ch and the church at Jerusalem would continue to grow and grow in numbers, as the text tells us. They would add to their numbers all along. And of course, sooner than later, persecution came along, and resistance to the gospel in the church appeared in Jerusalem. And chapter 7 reveals, or tells us, gives us the account of the first martyr of the faith, Stephen. Long story short, as stones were crushing Stephen's, uh, Stephen, Stephen's body, Luke said, and Saul approved of their killing. Why did Saul, that is Paul, approve of killing Stephen? He tells us here in our text today, I acted in ignorance and unbelief. There was another time Paul stood before a king. His name was King Agrippa, and he said to King Agrippa, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus Christ. I put many of the Lord's people in prison, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I tried to force them to blaspheme. I even hunted them down in foreign cities. You see, Paul, in his ignorance and unbelief, was zealous to protect his religion. We can ask the question then, was Paul using his ignorance and unbelief as an excuse for his actions? You know, like Adam did, to paraphrase that event, uh, the woman you gave me made me do it, or, or like Eve did, the, the devil made me do it. Or my parents didn't teach me to do the right thing, that's why I'm in jail. Or I was late for work, I didn't mean to speed officer and cause the accident and injure that person. Was Paul claiming ignorance and unbelief as an excuse? Short answer, no. Remember what Paul said about a person's status before God. Paul said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This word all means all, folks. No one is exempt. Yet Paul, with the very same breath, would also say, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. See, folks, what we have here is an example of what the reformer Martin Luther once said, quote, Is it not wonderful news to believe that salvation lies outside of ourselves? End quote. Or as Paul so beautifully put it here in verse 14, where he said, The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. See, friends, this was Paul's after story. The unmerited favor of God that is found in and through Jesus Christ had redeemed Paul despite his ignorance and unbelief, not because of it. What is your before and after story? Would you, have your, would you have described yourself as Paul did of himself? How would you describe your inner spiritual life today? Would you say you have a pure and vibrant faith? Would you consider your heart pure, your conscience good, and your faith sincere? That's how the Bible describes a pure and vibrant faith. Or have you found yourself often comparing yourself to others? And it's interesting, I did a little bit of research on this comparison stuff. And there is a thing called today in psychology, comparison syndrome. It's when you compare yourself to others to see how you measure up. And possibly you may come out better, maybe, than others in your estimation. And this makes you feel better or higher than someone else. Friends, this has been psychologized to no end in our culture. It is the very dominant philosophy in our culture today. It's the mantra of our culture. The question is, what does the Bible say about this? About this? Friends, it's a hard matter. When we start believing we are better than others because we would never do the things they did, we are only revealing the desires of our sinful nature. We're revealing, really, the true nature of our hearts. One time Jesus told this parable. One day two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was an, a despised tax collector of the day. And the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed like this. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. 
robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. The tax collector, standing at a distance from the Pharisee, he couldn't even raise his head to pray. And as he beat, his che- beat himself on the chest, he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So what did Jesus say in response to this parable? He said, I tell you, this man, that is the tax collector, rather than the other, that is the Pharisee, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Paul said to the Roman church, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the faith God has distributed to each of you. You see, the false teachers in the Ephesian church had long forgotten how to think with sober judgment. They thought very highly of themselves. We can use the saying, they look down their noses toward others. See, Verbeck challenges his readers to take a good look in the mirror. Will you find a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith? Well, moving along, Paul said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. And so, why don't we deal with the second half of verse 15, for 15b and verse 16 first. And Paul, here with all transparency, described himself as the worst of sinners. In verse 15, Paul said of himself, I am the worst. And we already see that he detailed in verse 13 that at one time he was a blasphemer, a persecutor. Pardon me, and a violent man. So was Paul calling himself the worst sinner of all time or of all people? Well, of course not. The context doesn't suggest that. The subject doesn't suggest that. He's not thinking along those lines. What else is Paul pointing to in these verses? Or better yet, who is Paul pointing to in these verses? This should be obvious to you and to me. Jesus Christ. What we have here before us is a contrast between a savior and the savior, uh, the savior and a sinner. We spent more enough time with the sinner Paul. What about the savior Jesus Christ? Well, the text reveals the very character of God the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is merciful. You see, Jesus was merciful to Paul, the worst of sinners. And the grace of Jesus Christ was poured out abundantly on Paul, who blasphemed the name of Christ. We also see that in dealing with Paul, Jesus Christ displayed his his, his immense, his perfect, his great patience. This immense patience for all who would have believed in Christ. And there's more here between the sinner and the Savior, that contrast. Our Savior gives to his followers, his disciples, faith, love, and eternal life. What about the Savior Jesus Christ? Well, the grace and mercy of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to our sinners is best said by Paul himself, who said, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. One time Jesus was having dinner, as Mark describes him in his gospel, with tax collectors and sinners. And the Pharisees, hearing about this, asked Jesus' disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus, hearing hearing this, said to the Pharisees, is it not the healthy who need a doctor? It is not the healthy, pardon me, who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus also said that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Jesus also said, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This brings us back to the Barner Research Group and their findings in respect to religion and faith. Specifically, the 40% of those who would identify as as evangelical born-again believers that believe Christians and Muslims worship the same God, 
which reveal some very troubling trends in the church. And some of these Christians probably also believe that there are other paths to God as well. One must, rest, one must recognize indeed that we live in a pluralistic culture. And pluralism is a dominant philosophy that motivates and energizes the legislation and the policies government create these days. It motivates and energizes the arts, education, and pretty much most spaces of the culture. Postmodernism, along with pluralism, have also in many ways impacted the religious sphere of our culture. And the findings of Barna Research Group revealed the impact on the evangelical church. Today we can't go much deeper because time does not permit, but suffice it to say that we recognize that this is a reality that we, we face today, which in many ways are similar or were similar to the ways things were happening with Paul and Timothy in the Ephesian church. Pastor and preacher Charles Spurgeon also appears to have been dealing with similar situations in the 1800s when he said about some of the preaching of his day, quote, there are some preachers who cannot or do not preach the blood of Christ. And I have one thing to say to you concerning them. Never go to hear them. Never listen to them. And Spurgeon went on, quote, the chief aim of the enemy's assault is to get rid of Christ, to get rid of his atonement, to get rid of his suffering in the place of men, end quote. Well, as we bring this to a close, considering what Paul said about the sinner and our Savior, when we consider the challenges Timothy was facing with the Ephesian church, with these false teachers peddling their spiritual wares, when we consider the impact it had on the Ephesian church, then as close as the 1800s, there were similar problems in the church. The question is, how are we to respond today in our cultural context? as the church. Well, friends, I think it begins with ourselves, with you and me. That's where it begins. Each one of us, as Verbic challenged, need to take a long, hard look in the mirror, an honest, hard look in the mirror. And ask yourself, will you find a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith there? Have you been careless with your theology? Today, as in Spurgeon's day, as many pre are, there are many preachers who do not preach the blood of Christ. They preach an empty human philosophy, a universalism maybe, a pluralism, a syncretism of other theological or other spiritual values. But there's one major difference then in the 1800s, and that's technology. And those who preach this other gospel spread their false teaching far and wide as the internet reaches so many places in the world. Many are very popular, very energetic, very charismatic speakers. They write many books, they travel and speak all over the world. Are you listening to their sermons online? Are, are you listening to their podcasts? Are you reading their books? Or maybe as you examine yourselves, the postmodern Pluralistic philosophies our cultures have found a place in your heart and your worldview. You know, it is important and good to understand others' worldviews. That way we can have a dialogue. We can have an honest and, and good dialogue, respectfully. We don't live in a vacuum as born-again believers. But this is the question. Have you adopted the culture's life, philosophy of life, or have you only Jesus? Because, friends, Jesus saves. So I want to end with, with the way Paul interrupts his letter as he comes to the end of these first few ver verses, as he considers what he was before and what he became after, an apostle of Christ Jesus, of, of the gift of grace he received and the faith and love he received from Christ. And he can't help but break out in a, a, a time of praise. And this is how we're going to end with this, with this doxology. That's what it's called. We'll use it as a prayer and uh, join me. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen.
Well, thank you so much. Have yourself a blessed day and shalom.